Yeah. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. Behold our names that are engraven in your hand. Open our ears and hearts to hear you speak to us now. In Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Family, I am so glad to be back here with you this, 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 this Sunday. Um, I was gone almost all this past week at a pastor's conference in Louisville, Kentucky, and it was, it was really amazing to not be in charge of anything, to not have to prepare to preach or teach, but to just sit there and be ministered to and lift my hands up as high as I could to worship God and be reminded of just why I love him so much. I savored every moment of it. I worshiped in spirit and in truth, and I, I sang at the top of my lungs, and I, I lifted my hands as high as I could. And after having a knot in my throat for multiple songs, I cried. They were tears of joy. There was this one song that said, your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, and now seated at your table. Jesus, thank you. Oh my gosh, it was so beautiful. I needed it so much. But do you know what I needed even more than that? Being with you all here this Sunday. That is so much more special to me. As, as much as I enjoyed hanging out with a group of pastors, it doesn't compare to worshiping with you all. They're my friends, but you're my family. I need this. I need this right here every Sunday, where the words that I sing have so much more meaning because I can sing around those people that I love the most and call not just my friends, but my family. And that song reminded me of, of my story and how God loved me despite my ugly story. You see, no one knows our story better than us besides God, right? There are sins that we've confessed to our friends, to a family member, sins that we've confessed to our, our significant other, our husband, or our wives, or our boyfriends and girlfriends. But if you've kept stuff in secret, God knows that it's there. Don't think because you haven't said it that it doesn't exist. It exists. And I'm grateful that every single week we have more than one opportunity to come clean with God. Pastor, I'm sorry, Elder Leon led us through a call to confession a little while ago, and they'll always end something like this with the assurance of pardon that says, hear these words of comfort, or hear the good news, we are forgiven. So I want you to be mindful of that as we get into this, knowing that there will still be one more opportunity to come clean with God before we partake of the Lord's Supper. Last week, Pastor Chris preached to us the first part of Romans 5. And if any of you have seen me with a baseball hat from time to time, you'll always see the same verse stitched in the back of the hat. And that is Romans 5.8. And I love it because it's a great conversation starter. It happened to me when I was in Atlanta waiting to catch a flight from there to Kentucky where somebody said, Romans 5.8, what is that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Romans 5.8 says that God showed his love for us in this. That while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to get our lives together. He didn't wait for us to get our acts together. He came for us despite, despite the ugliness in our lives. If that was the case, we'd still be waiting. If God waited for us to get our stuff together, we would still be waiting for him to come and offer us a path to salvation. So for me to hear those words that I was once an enemy of God, but now... Now I'm seated at his table. I have the opportunity to come to this very table every single Sunday, the same invitation that is extended to you. This table, for me, is, is, is everything. We're invited to come. We're invited to eat. We're invited to drink. And to be reminded that we are no longer at odds with God. We are now his friends. And that is so encouraging. It's a continuous offer of hope that no matter how ugly your past is, there's still a hope with God. There's still hope with Him. And we all need reminders of this. Even pastors, or should I say especially 
pastors. We all need to be reminded that this would be a guide, a, a way to guide our lives, a guide of what we say and how we act and how we treat each other, how we lead our wives, our children, our families, our office buildings or wherever we're at. We all have a circle of influence with people whom we have an impact on. We're invited to come, take, and eat. Today, we'll finish up Romans 5, and I want to see how we can connect today's sermon with what Pastor Chris taught us last week. We'll be reading Romans 5, verses 12 through 21. So I'd invite you to stand with me at this moment. If you have your Bibles, please open it up to Romans 5, and we'll be starting at verse 12. Romans 5, verse 12. And for those of you that don't have a Bible, or if you want to keep up with the, the translation that I'm reading, inside the bulletin towards the back is the exact scripture that I'll be reading. So if you don't have a Bible, don't be embarrassed. Grab a bulletin, and the, the scripture I'll be reading is right there verbatim, word for word. Let me get a solid amen when you're all there. Amen. Okay, I think that's solid enough. The Word of God reads as follows. Romans 5, starting at verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God. And the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. People of God, this is the word of God. Please be seated, family. So if you weren't here last week, I'll give you a cheat sheet. I'll tell you really quick what Pastor Chris said in his sermon. Pastor Chris taught us that we've already been justified with God by faith. And that faith and that justification produces within us the fruit of peace. Peace because we've been justified with God. That's the theme in the book from Paul to the Romans. You heard Pastor Chris talk about that in the catechism question. Justification and sanctification. We are justified by faith, which means we are, right, we are made right by God, with God, through our faith in him. Not because of anything we do. Not because of how much money we give or how often we come to church or how loud we sing or how much we serve, though all of those things are a part of the Christian life. That doesn't save us. It is only our faith in him that does that. So let's connect that with today's readings. And at the end, we'll conclude that not only is salvation through our faith in Christ, not only is that a certainty, but it is also present in abundance. In abundance. And we will compare Adam and Christ. Wait, how could these two possibly have anything in common? Adam and Christ. Well, let's see what we're talking about. Verse 12, it says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death came in through sin, 
And so death spread to all men because all sinned. Here he starts to say something, but he ends up kind of taking a rabbit trail where he'll come back and close that off in verse 18. He doesn't finish his sentence, at least not right here, but listen to what he says. He tells us that in the same way sin came into the world by one man, which is who? Adam. The same way sin came in by one man, Adam, through that sin came death. So death also spread to all mankind because we have all sinned, we have sinned, and we will sin. It got quiet because that's the nature of who we are. Are you with me so far? Romans 3.23 tells us this. It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Confirmation of what the Apostle Paul said again here. All have sinned. All have been infected by Adam's disobedience. And listen to what verse 13 says. It says, For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam. Listen to this, though. Who was a type of the one who was to come. We all know that sin existed before we were given the Ten Commandments, right? The Ten Commandments, the law was given to us as a magnifying glass to show us every time we offended a holy God. But we see this. It says that Adam was a type of the one who was to come. What does that mean? Is Paul actually comparing Adam, a creature from the dirt who was disobedient to our God, is he comparing him to Christ, our Lord, our Savior? How can there be any resemblance? Here's how. Through one single action of each of them, all of mankind was affected. Listen to what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 21 and 22. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be be made alive. Now listen to what this verse is saying and what it's not saying. It is saying that all those who are associated with Adam, in other words, all of mankind, all of those who are associated with Adam are affected by the fall. Every last one of us, because of what he did, because of how he disobeyed, everyone is infected, everyone is affected by his sin. It's also saying that in the same way, All those who are associated with Christ and in union with him shall be made alive. All men were infected by Adam. Those in Christ are affected by Christ's resurrection. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Salvation is made possible to all, but salvation doesn't apply to all. It only applies to those who believe in Christ. It only applies to those who have placed their full trust and salvation in him alone. Not based on anything that we've done. You see the difference? Through Adam's trespass, sin and death entered the world and affected all those that were in union with him, meaning all mankind. And through Christ's obedience on the cross, All those associated and in union with Christ, all those that have placed their faith and trust in him are made right with God. That's the antidote to the infection that we got from from Adam. It's faith. That's it. The doctrine of justification by faith. The teaching of justification by faith. We are made right with God, not by anything that we do. It's by believing in him and that he came to die for our sins. That's it. My question to you this morning is, do you trust him? Have you placed your trust and faith in Christ as the only means of salvation? Or are we just plain church? That's between you and God. I'm not going to judge you. 
I pray that each of you would have the same experience that I had when I was in Kentucky. That you would have the same experience that I look forward to every single Sunday here with you and lifting up my hands and worshiping God. That he would continue to speak to you as he does to me every single day when I open up his word to read it in the morning to get my day started the right way. Verse 15 says, But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many die through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God. And listen to this. And the free gift, by the grace of that man, of that one man, Jesus Christ, it abounded for many. Not all. It abounded for many. And this free gift is not like the result of the one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. Verse 17. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Here we have a contrast. It's showing how they're different. A comparison between Adam on one hand and Christ on the other. In Adam's case, a single sin was involved. In Christ's case, his work of redemption on the cross covered not only Adam's single sin, but all those that followed it after. Let me say that again. Adam made one single trespass in disobedience. Christ, his one work of redemption on the cross, covered not just Adam's original sin, but all those others that followed after it. How can you not love a man that way? How can you not want to be obedient to a man who has done this for you? How can you not? Verse 18 says, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners... So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. You guys hear the same drum beating over and over again? It's the same message. It's the same message. Paul wants us to remember this. Why is it so important? To be reminded of what Christ has done. It doesn't matter what happened in the past. What matters is what's happening now. Christ has made you whole. Does your life reflect that? Is there joy in your life knowing, having internalized this truth that God truly loves you? He did not let what one man did all that time ago affect your eternity. He gives us a way out. The question is, are we taking it? The question is, are we grasping that life preserver that he's thrown at us? Here Paul comes back to say what he started in verse 12. He starts to close up that sentence. He tells us this one key thing. He says, it shows us that justification doesn't only turn over the guilty verdict for us. It turns over the guilty verdict, but there's something else that happens. It's setting aside our death sentence. Not just that alone, but it also opens up the gate to life. Think about it. Your death sentence has been squashed, and not only turning over the verdict, but he's giving you life. A life in Christ. A life to be lived in abundance. What does your life in abundance look like today? Is it full in Christ? Or do we drown in a glass of water every single day when we look at all the things that aren't going right? Family, be reminded that there is life in Christ and it is a life abundantly given to us. The grace is abundant. It says, an abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in the life through that one man, Jesus Christ. It's up to us. What does that song say? My hope is built on nothing less. Nobody knows that song? Than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Do you trust him? 
Does your life reflect that trust in him? I continue to ask this because that is my one job I have here today. My one job is to help guide you toward a life of loving him, honoring him, and being obedient to him. That's my one job, to continue to remind you of what he's done. I love to sit here and crack jokes all morning, but I'm not here to entertain you. I want to give you the message that Christ has for us. These are eternal consequences. This isn't something that, I mean, if I have a joke, I'll give it to you, but that's not what I'm here for. I want to share with you my story. I want to share with you God's story, and I want to show you where you fall into that story. That's what we're here for today, family, to worship together corporately and to be reminded what God has done for us. There are so many testimonies in this room. I wouldn't be able to finish telling them in the time that we have here today. But I pray that as we fellowship, we'll get to know each other's stories. A lot of you know my story. I know a lot of your stories. And you know what? Some of our stories, they're not nice. Some of our stories are pretty ugly. Some of us more than others. But I think of Romans 5.8, what Pastor Chris preached last week. That God showed his love for us in this. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We have that peace. And I want to remind you today of what we're learning in the last part of it. Verse 20 says this. This is one of my favorite parts of this verse. It says, now the law came in to increase the trespass or to show us all of our sins. But listen to this. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Two points. The first is this. The law came in to show us our sin. Like I said, a magnifying glass to shine God's light on all the things that we're doing wrong. But the second point is this, that where the sin increased, God's grace abounded even more. That's a great place to say amen. Where, where sin increased, God's grace abounded even more. Think of that for a second. That means that our sin cannot outdo God's grace. If this is not comforting, I don't know what is. Now, at the same time, it's not a loophole to say, oh, well, I can go buck wild and do whatever I want because God's grace got me anyways. Yeah, technically you could say that. But as believers, we don't see things that way. As believers, we're not trying to get over on God. See, when I was in the world, I used to suffer from the come-ups. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Always trying to come up one way or the other. Always trying to get over a connection for this, a connection for that, a discount here, a discount there. I was always trying to buck the system, always trying to get over. I suffered from the come-ups. I was always trying to come up. You can't come up on God. You can't get over on God. If we are true believers in Christ, we do our best. Not because we're going to get saved by that, but because that's what he's called us to. But where we fail... His grace got us. His grace is what sustains us. His mercy is what carries us when we can't carry out whatever we're doing. Philippians 1.6 tells us this. It says, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work within you will complete it on the day of Jesus Christ. That's the sanctification that Pastor Chris was talking about. We are justified with God by our faith, but we're sanctified. Sanctified is, is, sanctification is a process. It's like, like we're continuous works in process. Like we're walking around with men at work and street zones and traffic and construction signs all around us. Because God is continuously working on us. And that process will be over the day Jesus comes back for us or when he takes us to be with him. He who began a good work within you will complete it. It doesn't say maybe. It doesn't say he'll try his best. When God has called you, he will complete the work that he started within you. I need you to understand that because only by understanding that can we truly internalize what he's done for us. When we're too weak to continue, God's Holy Spirit sustains us. And when we don't know what to say, it's God's Holy Spirit that gives us the words. Have you ever sometimes been talking to somebody and they ask you about your faith and you just like bloop, say some stuff and you're like, Oh my gosh, where did that come from? It, it, well, you know what I'm talking about? Like, it wasn't me. When you, do, you just do stuff that is like, where did that come from? Who was that that said that? It wasn't you. 
That was the Holy Spirit. And when you do bad stuff, don't try to blame that on the Holy Spirit. That's all you. That's all you. In the last verse, it says, verse 21, it says, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to what? Eternal life. That's what this is about. Eternal life through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Sin reigned in death, and grace reigns through Christ. Think about that. In the same way that Adam came into the world as a man and was not obedient, Christ had to come into the world as a man and be what? Obedient. Let's look at both real quick before I close. Adam was given authority over all creation. Christ was also given authority over all creation. Adam was tempted and he failed. Christ was tempted in the desert and he didn't fail. Adam caused all mankind to be infected with sin. Christ gave all of mankind the opportunity to be forgiven of that sin. Adam's disobedience to God leads to death. Christ's obedience to God leads to life. Adam gave authority to Satan. Christ took the authority back from Satan. So what can we learn from today's reading? We can learn this, really simple, that God made things right in the beginning. And then we come along and we screw things up. But because of his mercy, he comes in again and he makes things right. Think of your past. Think of how you started, how you screwed things up, and then God comes back into your life to make things right. Don't give up, family. There's always hope. You will screw things up. And God will be there to help make things right. Remember that. So what can... What does this have to do with us today? What can we do? It's all good information, Pastor Rudy. What does that mean to me today? Three things. The first is this. Even though we were born with the curse, Jesus gave us a way out. What are you doing with your chance? Have you chosen life? Or are you still walking down the road of sure death? The second is that this gift of God's grace and salvation is free. Grab onto it like a pit bull to a pork chop. Don't let it go. There's nothing you could do to earn it. There's nothing you could do to keep it. It is all God. But we are responsible for what we do with it. What are you doing with your salvation? What are you doing with the chance that God has given you? I'll just ask you a point blank question, and you don't have to answer me. I wouldn't. But the question is this Are you saved? And if you are, what are you doing with it? Are you honoring God with it? I don't see how someone who is saved can live any other way than that. But I'm going to ask you straight out. Are you even saved, bruh? Are you saved? It's not the kind of question you just ask somebody. Hey, my name is Rudy. How are you doing? Are you saved? But I want you to think about that as we close up today as we partake of the Lord's Supper, and as you go home and meditate that for the week, are you even saved? Are you drawing other people in to that same salvation? What does your life look like outside of church? And the last one is just an encouragement that even if we've started wrong, with God all things will end right. Even if you have started wrong, with God all things will end right. Our situations all look different, but in the end, we screwed something up. But we can trust that with him, in the end, all things will be made right. It doesn't mean we're not going to suffer. It doesn't mean we're not going to struggle. It doesn't mean we're, we're, gonna, we're not going to get sick or we're going to have the best job ever, or that our relationships won't have any problems, that everything will be perfect. It doesn't mean that. What it's saying is that they will end right. For he who began a good work within you will complete it upon the day of Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for speaking to us today through your word. We're so grateful, Lord, that you are not like Adam. 
that you were much greater than Adam, that you took back what the enemy tried to steal from us, Lord. We thank you and we bless your holy name so much. And Father, to the question, are you even saved? We say yes. Strengthen us, Lord, to put our faith and our trust in you. Lord, we believe, help our unbelief, Father. Strengthen us when we feel weak. Give us words of wisdom when we have none and when we feel scared. Give us boldness, give us confidence, and give us courage. We've been bold and courageous in things of the world. Father, let us be bold and courageous in your kingdom. Let us meditate upon your word. Let us focus upon your word. Let us get wrapped and enveloped in your word, Father, that it may penetrate every single part of our body, of our minds, of our hearts, and our souls, that we would give you thanks for all that you have done through us and all that you will do through us, Father. We love you, we bless you, and we praise your holy name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.